And now it's time for Choose Your Own Adventure, Cleopatra. It's 48 BCE, and you're a down-on-your-luck co-ruler of Egypt. You fled Alexandria because your husband, the pharaoh, who is also your brother, is trying to kill you. So now you're hiding out in Syria, on the lookout for incoming assassins sent by your brusband and his advisors. But then Julius Caesar, the most famous general in the Mediterranean, shows up in Alexandria, and he's not very pleased with your brother. You see an opportunity. If you can simply talk to Caesar, you know you can convince him to support your cause. But Caesar is in the heart of Alexandria, which is swarming with your brusband soldiers. Do you A. Give up and die in exile via snakebite? B. Roll into Alexandria with troops, spears blazing. Or C. Have your servants stealthily transport you to Caesar, wrapped rather suggestively in bed sheets. Oh, sheets! It's about to get real. Last week, we left Cleopatra in 51 BCE, 18 years old, and recently installed as the co-ruler of Egypt. She's charismatic, wealthy, well-educated, and like the rest of her family, a stone-cold killer. And she easily trumps her 10-year-old husband, Ptolemy XIII, in terms of experience and skill. What could possibly go wrong? Well, turns out, all that experience and skill made Cleopatra a liability for the influential male advisors at the Ptolemy's court. These advisors, including army generals, treasurers, and tutors, agreed that Egypt was too valuable to be led by the Ptolemies anymore. Plus, they were tired of cleaning up after their conniving and murderous rulers, and honestly, who could blame them? They believed that the best way to maintain Egypt was for them to take charge by ruling through a figurehead. Unsurprisingly, they hitched their wagon to the easily manipulated 10-year-old brother Ptolemy, rather than his clever and independent 18-year-old sister, Cleopatra. By 48 BCE, these advisors gained control, and Cleopatra fled to Syria with assassins on her heels. But it was there from exile, she began plotting a comeback. Now betrayal and assassination was the Ptolemaic dynasty's bread and butter when it came to political tools, but they also had a second favorite, Roman intervention. Remember when Cleopatra's father was exiled in Rome, and then he'd had his daughter who'd usurped him executed? Well, he managed that task by convincing the Romans to invade, do his dirty work, and place him on the throne. So now a chip off the old block, Cleopatra decided to bank on the same strategy. She would sit in Syria, stubbornly refusing to be murdered, and try to convince a Roman general to invade Alexandria and execute all of her enemies, starting with her dear brusband. Ptolemaic politics. It's a killer. Fortunately for Cleopatra, her troubles coincided with the rise of the most famous and arguably best general in Roman history, Julius Caesar. Like Cleopatra, Caesar was clever, charismatic, and increasingly inclined to murder all of his enemies to take sole control over the empire. Furthermore, when it came to choosing between Ptolemy and Cleopatra, Caesar already liked Cleopatra better because she hadn't killed his friend. But we'll get back to that. Caesar is treated as a big deal in Western history, and rightfully so. His name is synonymous with leadership, royalty, and he's the key transitional figure between the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. By the time Caesar came into Cleopatra's life, he was already the most famous man in the Mediterranean world. He'd been a Roman consul, member of the Triumvirate, and dictator. He'd subjugated Gaul, invaded Britain, and crossed the Rubicon, starting a civil war. Then he came to Alexandria to pursue his old friend, Pompey, who had now become his primary enemy in the vicious political split. Pompey represented the Roman Senate, opposing Caesar because they believed, perhaps correctly, that he planned to make himself dictator for life. Caesar was worried that if he didn't maintain rule over Rome, he'd be assassinated out of spite by Pompey and his allies. So he needs to find his old friend, even if he has to go as far as Egypt, which is exactly where Pompey fled after Caesar's forces destroyed his armies in Greece. But Caesar knew what his old friend was up to scrambling for safety across the Mediterranean, hoping to appeal to Ptolemy for money and soldiers. Because Pompey had proven instrumental in restoring Ptolemy's father to the Egyptian throne, he no doubt hoped the young pharaoh would respond in kind. September 48 BCE, an audience with the pharaoh. Caesar has arrived with his advisors and soldiers looking for Pompey, and he asks Ptolemy if he has any idea where his wayward friend might be, which is when Ptolemy stops him and reveals he has a surprise for Caesar. A welcome gift. And then he presents Caesar with Pompey's severed head. You see, Ptolemy's advisors, the same ones that thought they'd be super good at ruling Egypt, had decided to use Pompey's arrival as an opportunity to ingratiate themselves with the victorious Caesar. 
This was a slight miscalculation. Caesar may have been at war with Pompey, but he respected the man as a Roman leader. And Pompey had even married Caesar's only legitimate child, Julia, who had died in childbirth six years before. At the sight of his old friend's head, Caesar broke out in anguished tears. It wasn't just the personal slight. The idea of foreigners murdering a Roman leader was considered a gross injustice in Roman culture. It was a bad, ignominious death. This sort of gruesome act might have worked with the Ptolemies, but it was considered unacceptable in Rome. And in the wake of Ptolemy's grisly gift, Cleopatra picked C and snuck back into Alexandria, arriving in Caesar's chambers wrapped in bedsheets. And it's this moment that launched a thousand historical novels, plays, and films. The two most famous people in world history at the time, in the same room. Caesar and Cleopatra, Rome and Egypt. In history, Caesar's relationship to Cleopatra is often treated as a momentary dalliance on his road to immortality. But what if we treated Caesar as a momentary dalliance in Cleopatra's rise to power? How does that flip the script? Because from Cleopatra's perspective, Caesar was central to her plans, the perfect stepping stone back into power. The 52-year-old Caesar and 21-year-old Cleopatra were separated by three decades, but quickly discovered common political ground and likely a common bed. Then soon afterward, Caesar sent his soldiers to collect Ptolemy for an audience. A non-optional audience. And the fact that Caesar summoned the pharaoh, rather than going to him, showed exactly who was really in charge. At the meeting, Caesar declared his intention to see Ptolemy and Cleopatra reconciled, ruling Egypt together again. But this time, under Rome's watchful eye, of course. Ptolemy's advisors rejected the declaration and attacked Caesar's forces in Alexandria. They'd hoped to force Caesar into reconsidering his declaration, but it only cemented Caesar's commitment to Cleopatra. And by January of the following year, Caesar was victorious, Ptolemy drowned in the Nile, and Cleopatra was pregnant. She then reassumed the throne, this time with another brother, Ptolemy XIV, as her husband and nominal co-ruler. But there was no question as to which sibling really controlled Egypt, and similarly there was no question to whom Cleopatra was romantically linked. Caesar and Cleopatra celebrated their victory in grand fashion, sharing a triumphal cruise down the Nile in the spring of 47 BCE that included 400 ships and most of Caesar's army. A few months later, Cleopatra gave birth to a son named Caesarion. You know, in case there was any doubt who the father was. Now it's important to note that despite their relationship, Caesar and Cleopatra could not be married. Both had spouses already, and both Roman and Egyptian law made the formalization of their union impossible. Yet, there was still a great deal of benefit for both Caesar and Cleopatra in having produced a child. For Cleopatra in particular, she not only cemented Roman support for her regime, but could also count on a close relationship with Rome's leader. Furthermore, bearing a child meant that she could establish her own line of succession, one that was free from entanglements with her bloodthirsty Ptolemaic brothers and sisters. Historians often obsess over how male rulers pursued procreation to cement alliances and establish succession. Here, Cleopatra did the exact same thing, but because she was a woman, scholars often couch her activities in terms of seduction and sex, rather than what it was, a political masterstroke. In the span of about 10 months, Cleopatra had directed Rome's greatest man to reestablish her reign, kill her brother, and leave her with an heir. And on top of all of that, she not only maintained independence for Egypt, but Caesar also gave her control of Cyprus, which Rome had annexed a decade before. And while Caesar couldn't officially marry Cleopatra, he certainly wasn't bashful about his new lover. On his return to Rome, Caesar installed a golden statue of her in the Roman Forum inside the Temple of Venus. And when Cleopatra visited Rome herself in 46 BCE with baby Caesarian in tow, Caesar hosted them at a villa across the Tiber River from his own house. Not exactly subtle. And that's where she was on March 15, 44 BCE. She was 25 years old, living in a lavish villa with two empires and the Mediterranean's greatest man at her feet. What could possibly go wrong? Legendary thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Gunnar Clovis, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One for helping to make this show possible. 